Namaste and welcome to the Healing Mirror Podcast. My name is Saraya Saraswati and here I'm offering discussions, global satsangs and interviews with spiritual teachers, philanthropists and awakened and inspirational humans. I've been wondering about how when someone criticizes me and I feel that sense of attack and discomfort and then if somebody compliments me there's a warm feeling of joy and happiness and I wonder whether the one should be not influenced or affected by either to remain in that one well there's no shoulds you will experience what you experience until you experience something different and that might sound like a little bit of a riddle but until we are less identified with the separate body mind and the propping up of the separate body mind then we will have a reaction now this is neither good nor bad because it's just to be noticed at different times we will experience things differently but what i have found is that as the importance is shifted from the separate body mind and the preferences here to simply what is then there will be a reaction of um, enjoying praise and feeling hurt by even constructive criticism it is a wonderful place to be when it doesn't matter which way it goes because it offers great freedom but we can't leap into that in a false way it has to occur naturally as our attachment to our self as the separate person as the construct that we've developed around that personality and and the uh, propping up of that personality and persona or the mask that we wear I've got a little hatch in here i think of ants in my room tonight it's very 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 warm here my glasses were slipping down my nose <laughs> But it's a good question because the very important thing is, you know, if you suddenly, you know, someone criticizes you and you and you go into, oh, I've been unjustly accused. That's so wrong. Never really hurt my feelings. Just notice that and go, whoa, gosh, I'm really attached to me being the good guy here, aren't I? or I'm really, really affected by, by what other people think of me. Just see that for what that is. We've been brought up this way, you see. We've been, society very much props up the image that we put out to the world. And very, very often, and you see it on social media, there's very, very often that's not authentic. 
and putting on the brave face when you're actually really suffering inside or, or whatever that is, it's much more authentic to be in touch with your feelings and go, okay, I really reacted to that criticism. What reacted? Why was I so attached to what that person had to say? Who was so attached? Because it's certainly not consciousness. Consciousness doesn't care one way or the other. In the stream of love, you are loved anyway. Whether you're, you know, the beggar, the thief or the murderer. Self-inquiry, this is where we use our inquiry. This is where awareness comes into its, into its own. Awareness is the key to freedom. First of all, becoming aware of the reactive behavior that's here. The reactive behavior that leads us to forget our true identity. Trace that reactive behavior back. It might be attached to a childhood time where perhaps you were bullied or criticized. So you made yourself better so that you would get praise. All very innocent. And, and it may have served you really well in, in those times of crisis. But now that you're committed to awakening, it's no longer serving you. It's pulling you back into the identity as a separate persona, a separate, separate from everybody else that needs reinforcing, that personality needs to be reinforced and propped up and held. But really, really what we want is let it crumble, let it fall away. Come to a point where you can say, I don't know, I just don't know. And then your glass is empty and it can be filled. Okay. I'm also wondering about if I'm the person that's criticizing or praising, what what is my role in that? Who is criticizing? Who is praising? Why is there a need for this? If there is a need for positive action, then act. If there is a need for something to be done, then do it. If you can do something to rectify a situation, then then do that. But if there's nothing that can be done by you for a situation, watch it, observe, notice. Even sending your love is doing something. Holding someone in your heart is offering something. But offering criticism and judgment is actually not really helping a situation. However, again, that's what will happen until it doesn't. If that's our vibration, then that's what we'll do. And one day that will fall away and it'll be less and a little bit less and a little bit less until it just doesn't happen anymore. But always when it does happen, bring your awareness there. Meet the situation with awareness, clear observation. And avoid going into self-criticism. If you feel you've fallen in the doo-doo, avoid adding more doo-doo to that by criticizing the self because that only complicates it again. We will do what we do until we don't. It sounds quite simple. Spending time in nature. And
And when we're in nature, just to look at something as it is, to see a tree like a child that's never seen a tree before, to notice a bird that you may have seen a hundred times, but it's the first time you've seen it in this moment. Bringing a sense of freshness into the moment, which is the only place where life exists. And if each moment is met with a fresh, open, curious mind. And the mind chatter may still go on, but it'll start to sort of recede into the background. And you'll begin to notice it less and less as you begin to pay it less and less attention. And ultimately, there'll be more and more periods of no mind, which I can tell you is really wonderful, <laughs> where there's nothing going on. But then if we need to meet a situation and that mind is the perfect tool for it, pure intelligence will come through with much, much greater clarity and with ideas that blow you out of the water. Think, oh, where did that come from? Gosh, isn't that wonderful? And we have to be careful not to claim those then as our own, but go, thank you. <laughs> So hopefully that's helpful, Girish. Yes, thank you. But this is the dilemma of the human mind. It goes in and out, in and out of consciousness. And, and that's okay because that will just go on until it clears, it's like a muddy pond. It takes time once all the mud's stirred up by the rain and the wind and the, and the floods. It takes time for that, all that sediment that's been stirred up to settle. Time which doesn't really exist, <laughs> but I'm using that as a term that we understand here. I was re um, <clears throat> reflecting on um, Girish's question about, um, you know, when we when we judge somebody, when we criticise or we compliment somebody, and where that's coming from. And um, I noticed that um, I get I, I can get really quite excited about things, and you know become really exuberant of, and and gushing with people sometimes and um uh yeah i was just reflecting on that really and and how that in some ways if i suppose the intention is um just to express something but how it can be um I guess it's not my responsibility how that's used. <laughs> I was thinking about how it can how it can stroke ego sometimes, and I noticed that certainly with my father. <laughs> um, and just that this sometimes there is no need actually to um, it's just being around people, isn't it? And then I was thinking about compassion because if we don't express anything at all. And we just are, ah, that's a really powerful place to be. Um, so that compassion can be speak, uh, not communicated verbally. I think it's wonderful that you're exuberant sometimes. And sometimes we, we have that energy flow, don't we? And I can be like that too. And you can laugh and enjoy and, 
And if that's just completely authentic and completely free flowing, wonderful. It's like a child playing and laughing with friends. And I mean, I don't want to give the wrong impression here. Being spiritual doesn't have to mean all quiet and pious and, and unexpressive. It can be beautifully expressive. And I'm a very expressive person myself. You know, I, and I love people. Um, and I love to watch people when they're, when they're just being joyful and playful as well. I also like to balance that with spending a lot of time alone and in silence. There, you see, the wonderful thing is here, this is a playground. There's no right and wrong. But we know, we feel when we've been taken over by reactivity. There's a difference, isn't there? When we feel that reactivity taking us over and someone will say something and we feel that emotion bubbling up, that's quite different. It can throw us completely off balance. But there's other sensations that come through the body that give us wisdom. For instance, we may be going into a situation and our body just says no. And if we listen to that and don't, follow through and go into that situation, then that's listening to the energetics and the, and the uh, barometer of the soul here and following that intuition. That's wisdom. I have a little grandson and uh, a granddaughter who's due to be born tomorrow, actually. And I just love just sitting and watching that those beautiful, joyful expressions and that innocent curiosity. It's, it's just beautiful. And to be around little children and to be around animals and to be in nature, these honestly have been the greatest teachers, uh, the greatest gurus, if you like to use that term, which simply means dispelling darkness. But it's very important that we understand that it doesn't mean that we're not passionate. If we are passionate and that is pure and clear, then that flows through. It doesn't mean that we're not sometimes exuberant and we want to dance and move and flow. If that's what's happening and it's clear and free, beautiful. But when we're putting something on and it's coming from the separate self and it's, it's, um, it's reactive and it's um, propping up an identity which is not true. That's when we are lost. Energy can move freely through. Consciousness can do anything from a, you know, um, a dolphin spinning to a Sufi spinning. <laughs> it's all wonderful and it's all perfect. So, yeah, it's really important that we don't get religious with our spirituality and think everything has to be pious and particularly one way. And everything has its place here. But we know, we feel, don't we? And each of you would feel when you're unauthentic, when you're reactive, when your center has been lost when your judgmental mind is taking over when the little voice when you're just listening to the little voice instead of the silence and if you notice that that little voice is getting louder and louder be aware of that and seek for the bed of silence upon which the voice is speaking Hmm. no that's really um <clears throat> really helpful actually um and it it um it makes a lot of sense that um i, I i'm really aware of um this wanting to spend more and more time in that um in that place of of solitude silence and uh really cultivating 
the uh, that place of peace because what I'm noticing is that the more I spend in that place, the more I see it reflected back, mm. and I'm just getting just beginning to get that really get that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's perfect, and that's so true. And I find balancing time alone in silence in nature uh, in simply being helps to stabilize the clarity so that then when you go into active action in the world you are not so easily knocked off your peace perch <laughs> <laughs> if I can call it that. And you're not so easily drawn back into um, that, um, the identity of the separate body mind. But you can still enjoy, you know, family, friends, etc. I mean, universe, the universe, once we are clear, will use us suddenly we'll find ourselves doing something we didn't think we'd be doing, like facilitating this satsang, for instance, not something that was in my plan. Singing music with Terry, not something that I'd ever thought of, I'd never even heard of Terry Oldfield, sorry, <laughs> you know, until we met and the universe put that together. And, 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 and um, Colette met Terry when his first child was born, all of a sudden we reunite in Ireland last year. Who would have ever thought? A midwife and a, and a father reuniting. And here we are in satsang together. I mean, the universe comes up with these bizarre things. We could never have dreamed that up. Yet we think we're in control. Oh, we are so wrong. <laughs> And the wonder of that, the magnificence of that, that makes me passionate. It's so fascinating how this, you know, this holographic universe and this web of life and, and how each line in the web can meet and we can touch each other, points of consciousness connecting. It's really beautiful. You know, this is a small group, but what a precious one. And how the heck did we all get together? Not in our plan, not in our mind. We were directed here, weren't we? The universe needs people waking up. You know, this, I really do feel that the earth realm is going into a new era. And um, the amazing astrology, for instance, for this, this um, coming solstice on the 21st of December, it's a really good time to, you know, I, I just feel like my broken leg has been this gift. Again, there's so many gifts it's brought spending so much time i don't go out i just i'm just here quietly most of the time silently uh, allowing a deepening and if we have the space and COVID has given us this space this year for this what a gift if we have the eyes to see and uh, understand that And we will be used in tiny ways, in bigger ways. There's, there's no big, there's no small. Everything is. It's only in the eyes of the, the um, humanity that something seems larger than another. Denisha is being offered this wonderful experience to go and be of service to her 92-year-old mum. And Sarah's just had the wonderful experience of helping her father over and so many lessons came with that. 
and also a noticing that it doesn't all have to fit into our perfect idea of how things could or should be because all the coulds and all the shoulds and all the idealistic nature and the pious ideas are all out the window life is unfolding as it is and if we can be with that as it is warts and all then there's peace but it's over to terry now thank you terry i'd like to say something about the The direct path. You may have heard of the direct path, <clears throat> which actually on the direct path, no step is taken because the path, the direct path leads nowhere. It leads now to now here and When we, under, when we think we understand something, it's actually nobody that understands. What's, what understands is what is understood. I may be, you may think I'm talking in riddles here, but I'll try and explain. The thing that understands is that which is understood. And this is the... The, the the whole background of the know thyself path because it's the whole mechanics of of recognition that I spoke I speak about a lot that creates the illusion of a separate self because there's that constant taking from the past, putting it onto the present and creating this illusion of continuity. It's really, really such a, a magic thing if we, if this process itself can understand itself, because there's nobody that understands it. It's the process itself of the mechanics that recognizes its own mechanics, it knows itself through the process of recognition that creates this illusion of a separate self. So in, in the yogic tradition, there's this wonderful phrase, we use the mind to jump over the mind and Sarayas often, often speaks of this. Well, it's the, the, the mechanics of recognition that creates the elusive ego that can recognize its own process of recognition. And that dissolves the whole illusion because it sees its own reflection in its own mechanics. If we could just see this without the seer, Now, I may be seeming to speak a bit of nonsense here, but it's actually so difficult to see from the point of view of separation. But once you jump into it and become it, The understanding becomes the action itself. So on the direct path, no step is taken. We are already here at the place we want to get to. 
So knowing that, having faith, if you like, having trust, not quite believing, believing is not the right word, but totally trusting in that, we are totally convinced that there's nothing we can do to change anything in the flow of creation. You know, if we think we're doing it, that's the mechanics of recognition in action, creating a feeling of knowing what it is. But step out of that knowing and action becomes pure in the sense that it's never happened before other than the way it is now. And that leaves us with a freedom that can actually explore this present moment rather than being stuck in a path to something. We are on the path in which no step is taken because we are already arrived. It's impossible to understand from one point of view of separation. But know thyself. It knows itself. Nobody understands. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds strange. Language, language takes you into a quagmire sometimes, but nobody understands. The thing that understands is the thing that is being understood. It understands itself. The process of understanding is trying to understand itself. And once it understands itself, sees itself, knows itself, it becomes itself. which it already is. Um. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> it's so tricky speaking of this because you cannot pin it down to being anything other than this and this has to be enough you see this has to be enough you, 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 there isn't anything else <laughs> there really isn't there's nothing else so can we be with this and watch the process of recognition in action, good, bad, all that stuff. Don't like it, do like it, love it, hate it, want it, don't want it, and not get caught up in being that process. Can we allow the process itself to discover itself enough to stop creating the, the, the observer of it all, who's a complete and utter illusion. Good. I, I, it's such a delight to hear what you've said, because I can really feel the liberation that comes from those words, that, that sense. It's incredibly liberating to know that we're just, this is it, here. There's no more yearning or searching or criticizing or judging. This is it. It's lovely. Thank you. So therein lies the no choice bit, you see, and that's not saying that that's not 
it's a, it's a bad or a good thing. There just is no choice. It's a fact. There just isn't. Because this is it, this is what we've got. This is it. There is nothing else other than this. And there's no way of realizing that because the thing that's trying to realize it is an illusion until the process of realization itself sees itself in action, in trying to escape from the moment, and it can't. <laughs> we cannot um, have other than what's happening. It's a melting away of the veil between the actor and the reality. And once that veil melts away, that sense of separation melts away, there's just one. Again, it comes back to there's the actor and there's the part that the actor's playing on the stage. Does the actor lose themselves in, in the character or does the actor remember who it truly is? Once it, if it always remembers who it truly is, then, then there's no veil. There is just that one. Mm. And I love the passion that Terry shared that with. There is, when passion occurs, passion is free and, and clear. And, uh, and that's what is. When everything, all the trying and the doing melts away, life occurs anyway. Everything happens. We think we're making it happen as a separate identity. No. We're just creating suffering by resisting it. Do you want to say anything else, Terry? Well, just, just to remember that it's, it's mind that sees its own automation and ceases to be automatic in the sense other than doing its job of driving cars, um, doing things that require knowledge, reading, all that sort of stuff. Knowledge has its place, of course. It's necessary, totally necessary. But it doesn't need to create a, a character out of that knowledge and history. So, All I can say is just watch the process in action without judgment and it, it understands itself out of the picture. It will understand itself, it will be quiet, it will stop grabbing a place for itself as a separate entity. It will do that if it understands itself out of the picture. It understands itself. And that's such an important difference between I and I understand, I'm gaining all this understanding. You see that that's that's totally the foundation of ego. It's it's the veil of Maya. That that is the way Maya casts the veil across the, the whole thing. It's using that whole process, the mechanics of recognition to create separation. It's very, very amazingly brilliant and so hard to see through. <laughs> 
Yeah. But it can see through itself. So until we understand that, that, that subtle difference between trying to understand it and letting it understand itself, it's it's a it's a it's a spiritual path to nowhere. This is the direct path, knowing that we are already here. And the magic is that once we have seen it, it cannot be unseen. Once we see that truth, we cannot unsee it. We can slip back, but that seeing has occurred and it will draw us because we know it's truth. Hmm. So just moving from know thyself to let it know itself. <laughs> okay. I'll bring our satsang to an end. Thank you, everybody, for being here, for all your wonderful pointings and sharings and promptings and that have come through that aren't yours at all, of course. <laughs> it's all our love. Namaste. Join me for upcoming podcasts. And please, if you found this helpful or you'd like to share a comment or perhaps your own experience, I'd love for you to leave that message down below this podcast. I enjoy reading your feedback and I'm sure we can all help each other to hold hands, to remain awake, present, clear and loving. Namaste.